I want you to hit me as hard as you can. The boring rampage of revenge that borrowed from, uh, that is, paid homage to kung fu flicks, spaghetti westerns, and 70s exploitation, Kill Bill's production had its fair share of difficulties and controversy. And then the whole bloody affair was split into two parts. But just don't try to tell Quentin Tarantino that it's his fourth and fifth film. What are you doing? Hey, don't do that. Don't do that again. Sharpen your heart, Tori Hanzo, and let's find out what the f happened to this movie. Kill Bill's origins go back to 1994's Pulp Fiction, when Tarantino and Mia Wallace herself, Uma Thurman, started kicking around the idea of a martial arts movie, presumably over $5 milkshakes and a pack of red apples. Fan theory suggests Kill Bill's deadly Viper assassination squad was a natural extension of Fox Force 5. What? The fake pilot that starred Mia Wallace as part of a quintet of female secret agents with character-specific specialties. The similarities don't go far beyond that, but the onset brainstorming justified a credit at the end of Kill Bill, based on the character of the bride, created by Q and U. After 1997's Jackie Brown, Tarantino took a hiatus and finally sat down to write Kill Bill beginning in 2000. And indeed, he would write, and write, and write, ending up with over 220 pages. The script would be a mashup of martial arts movies, spaghetti westerns, revenge tales, 70s exploitation, comic books, anime, and more. Before production got rolling, Tarantino made Thurman study some of the key films of the genres, Sergio Leone's A Fistful of Dollars, Blaxploitation classic Coffee, and John Woo's action masterpiece The Killer. One of Tarantino's hallmarks is his barrage of references and inspirations, but no other film of his up to that point had as many. The basic plotline of Kill Bill is taken from Francois Truffaut's The Bride Wore Black, about a woman tracking down five men who killed her husband on their wedding day. Period movie Lady Snowblood offered visual and structural nods, including Kill Bill's animated sequence, designed by Production IG, the studio responsible for Ghosts in the Shell and Neon Genesis Evangelion. Thanks for watching Joe Blow Videos. If you enjoy our shows, please like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Now, back to the show. From Hong Kong martial arts classic Five Deadly Venoms came the codename idea. With Centipede, Snake, Scorpion, Lizard, and Toad, swap for reptilian call signs Black Mamba, Snake Charmer, Cottonmouth, Copperhead, Sidewinder, and California Mountain Snake. Wardrobe influences included putting the bride in Bruce Lee's Game of Death tracksuit and giving L Driver an eye patch, borrowed from Sweden's Thriller, also aptly titled They Call Her One Eye. There's even a Klingon reference, possibly foreshadowing Tarantino's plan for an R-rated Star Trek movie. It's no surprise that the cultured, encyclopedic filmmaker took influences from around the globe and into deep space. The film also borrowed heavily for the soundtrack, with cues from The Grand Duel, Twisted Nerve, Another Battle, Summertime Killer, and, again, Lady Snowblood. The Wu-Tang Clan's RZA, a fellow kung fu fanatic, would also help provide the proper retro musical atmosphere, with a score including brand new scene change themes, also known as stabs. Tarantino spent a year and a half writing, often bouncing ideas off his muse, saying, quote, I was writing it, and she was reading it, and we're talking about it, and we're hanging out, and I'm getting to know her all over again. Her rhythm of speech and that kind of stuff you want to do as a writer. When the script was completed in 2001, Tarantino set about officially casting. Making up the deadly Viper assassination squad would be Uma Thurman as the bride, aka Beatrix Kiddo, Black Mamba, a name not actually revealed until volume two, unless you count a blink and you'll miss it plane ticket while the bride heads to Okinawa. Thurman was always meant for the lead, and production was placed on hold while she was pregnant. As Tarantino put it, quote, if Joseph von Sternberg is getting ready to make Morocco, and Marlene Dietrich gets pregnant, he waits for Dietrich. The role of Bill, aka Snake Charmer, had a few potential actors tied to it. Tarantino specifically wrote the part for Warren Beatty, then practically on the cusp of retirement. The two talked, but the legendary actor couldn't commit the time or required training. Bruce Willis was even on the short list. Hey, maybe Tarantino just liked the way he held a sword. The role would go to David Carradine, star of one of Tarantino's favorite TV shows, Kung Fu, a series verbally acknowledged in Pulp Fiction. Rounding out the rest of the squad would be Vivica A. Fox as Vernita Green, Copperhead, 
Lucy Liu as Oren Ishii, Cottonmouth, Mr. Blonde himself, Michael Madsen, as Bud, Sidewinder, and Daryl Hannah as L. Driver, California Mountain Snake. Cast after Tarantino saw her in the made-for-TV thriller First Target and thought she would be a great mirror of Thurman. The supporting cast would feature martial arts icon Sonny Chiba, also an advisor, as Swordmaster Hattori Hanzo, Gordon Liu as both the crazy 88 leader and cruel mentor Pai Mei, a legendary character who also appeared in Shaw Brothers entries like Clan of the White Lotus. Battle Royale's Chiaki Kurayama as deadly bodyguard Gogo Yubari, and Michael Parks in dual roles, one of which was originally intended for Khan himself, Ricardo Montalban. With an initial budget of $39 million, Kill Bill began rolling in June 2002, with a grueling schedule of shooting six days a week, as opposed to a traditional Hollywood Five. It would also mostly be shot in sequence, a highly difficult task due to the logistics of securing cast and locations. It would be especially challenging for this production, since filming locations included everywhere from Austin, Texas and Los Angeles to Tokyo and Hong Kong. Cinematography would be handled by Robert Richardson, the first of six with Tarantino as of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Richardson was also an Oliver Stone favorite. And we can't help but feel QT stole him from Stone as revenge for the director's distortion of his Natural Born Killer script. Helping the bride slash her way down the list through action and fight choreography would be Yin Wu Ping, who helped garner Jackie Chan attention with films like Snake in the Eagle's Shadow and Drunken Master, before coordinating fights for The Matrix. One of the best examples of his contributions is the trailer fight between The Bride and Elle, oddly enough influenced by Jackass the movie. As Thurman put it, quote, It was so absurd. Two skinny blonde girls, one covered in garbage, and the other one all decked out with an eye patch, beating each other up inside a trailer. Once Tarantino began shooting, he became like a man possessed, excising portions of the original script and adding new ones as inspiration struck. He even chopped out an entire chapter called Yuki's Revenge, in which the sister of a bodyguard cut down by Thurman's bride comes seeking bloody vengeance for her slain sibling. The most daunting and time-consuming sequence was the seven-minute House of Blue Leaves, which took an exhausting eight weeks to shoot, six weeks longer than originally intended. Tarantino's ambition was for it, quote, to be to kung fu fights what the apocalypse now ride of the Valkyrie scene was to battle scenes. The director, as always, refused to use CGI, instead opting for practical effects, even employing the old school trick of condoms filled with fake blood for squibs. Of the movie's 450 gallons of fake blood, 100 were expended at the House of Blue Leaves. The amount was gratuitous enough to require changing a chunk of the sequence to black and white in order to appease the censors and dodge an NC-17 rating. Tarantino found the film to be one of his greatest challenges, particularly this protracted massacre, saying, quote, That's where I was really trying to take myself to a different place as a filmmaker and throw my hat in the ring with other great action directors. The director also used this moment to work in his cameo. He originally wanted to do voiceover for Pai Mei to pay homage to the notoriously poor dubbing of martial arts films, but decided against it. Instead, he would pop up as one of the slaughtered Crazy 88s. While hard to spot, it's still arguably Tarantino's best performance so far. The director had two other unseen cameos. The first came when Tarantino decided he had to be the one to stand in for Bud spitting snuff on Thurman, which he described as, quote, intricate work. The next came when he stepped in to choke the bride with the chain of Gogo's meteor hammer. He later used this niche skill for a shot in Inglorious Bastards, strangling actress Diane Kruger himself. And you thought feet were as weird as fetish. But the most controversial and objectively reckless act came towards the end of production. With less than one week until wrap, Thurman still had to shoot a scene in which the bride drives to Bill's house to confront the man whose actions literally triggered the plot. Unfortunately, a number of crew members, Tarantino included, did not consider the scene a stunt, and therefore no stunt people were on set, especially Thurman's primary double, Zoe Bell. Although reluctant, Thurman was coerced into getting behind the wheel of the 1973 Carmangia herself. 
By all accounts, the car was far from in pristine condition, with altered transmission and a seat not properly attached. To reassure his lead, Tarantino himself tested the route that the car would take. However, for the actual filming, the path had been reversed, with Thurman beginning where Tarantino had ended his test. Near the end of the shot, with Thurman traveling 40 miles an hour, the vehicle hit a mini S-curve and crashed into a tree. Uma Thurman suffered back and neck injuries. The accident is a clear demonstration of the dangers of abusing onset safety, and also one that was covered up for nearly 15 years. The story only came out when revelations of Hollywood warthog Harvey Weinstein's sexual abuse and rape were emerging under the power of the Me Too movement. The mogul had allegedly wanted to cover up the accident, with Thurman even suspecting he had the car destroyed. Miramax refused to give Thurman the footage at the time, reportedly willing to, quote, relinquish it only if she signed a waiver releasing them from liability. Uma Thurman declared the actions, quote, negligent to the point of criminality, while Tarantino would later call it, quote, the biggest regret of my life. And that's coming from the guy who gave us this attempted Australian accent. Shut up, Black. You ain't got nothing to say. I want to hear. The incident caused a rift in the professional and personal relationship between Tarantino and Thurman for years. When production on Kill Bill finally wrapped, Quentin Tarantino had shot more than 700,000 feet of film, equating to nearly 1,300 hours. On top of all those reels of film, the production was over budget and over schedule. The full cost had expanded to $55 million, and it took 155 days to finish shooting. Just three months before the scheduled release of Kill Bill neared, it was ironically Harvey Weinstein, aka Harvey Scissorhands himself, who came up with the idea to split the movie into two parts, which he thought would better capitalize on the box office since theaters could have more showings per day. As one film, Tarantino would have to ditch or shorten multiple key scenes, like the anime sequence and the Pi Mei portion. As two movies, he had breathing room to flesh out the characters and story. Referring to a shorter one-movie version, Tarantino said, quote, That's not what I spend a year and a half writing, alright. Naturally, slicing through the movie like a Hanzo through a henchman wasn't quite that simple. As the actors had originally signed on for a single film, contract renegotiations would subsequently need to take place. Kill Bill Volume 1 opened in October 2003, with Volume 2 hitting theaters the following April. Collectively, the film brought in more than $330 million at the worldwide box office. The movie did face some uproar for its carnage content. Tarantino rebutted, quote, Violence is a form of cinematic entertainment. It's just one of those cinematic things you can do. And it's one of the funniest things. I love it. It's fun. One can only imagine how over the top the scrapped video game could have been. Still, the Kill Bill movies were critical hits and did fairly well on the awards circuit considering the genre. The film is undoubtedly a work of feminist power. One that champions a woman as mother and warrior and a true badass at both. Thurman, too, was delighted with the movie and her character, commenting that, quote, high school girls were referring to defending themselves as saying they were gonna do an Uma on someone. For those keeping score, Kill Bill is considered to be a single movie by Tarantino himself. As one epic roaring rampage of revenge, the film is known as The Whole Bloody Affair, clocking in at a bladder-challenging 215 minutes. The Whole Bloody Affair premiered at the 2006 Cannes Film Festival, with notable changes including an excise cliffhanger, a gorier animated sequence, and a full-color version of the House of Blue Leaves sequence. Additional screenings unspooled beginning in 2011 at Tarantino's own New Beverly Cinema in Los Angeles. Beyond that, only a select few groups have hosted screenings of the extended version, including the Philadelphia-based Exhumed Films. The print is so hard to come by that Exhumed Films used Tarantino's personal copy, the same screened at Cannes, complete with subtitles. Much of the modern talk about Kill Bill involves the oft-mentioned sequel, one of Tarantino's many elusive projects. 
It's something he has been teasing and gabbing about since the release of the initial two movies, and has gone on record about it as recently as 2021, when on the promotional tour for his novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But Tarantino doesn't just bang out a script in a weekend, or two decades as it seems, saying, quote, I didn't just want to come up with some cockamamie adventure. The character doesn't deserve that. Some hypothetical sequel plot details have included Vernita Green's grown-up daughter seeking revenge, or perhaps Gogo's twin sister, or El Driver, or the mutilated Sophie Fatale. Other rumors would cast Maya Hawke, Thurman's daughter with Ethan Hawke, as an adult BB. But realistically, Kill Bill Volume 3 probably will not be the filmmaker's 10th and purportedly final film. Or as he stated, quote, I f***ing killed myself on Kill Bill. I don't want to think about that shit anymore. And so we can probably consider it shelved. Much like Tarantino's adaptations of Luke Cage and Silver Surfer, his remakes of Westworld and Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, his medieval Helen Mirren movie, his takes on the Bond and Star Trek franchises, or any of the dozens of expansions within the Quentin Tarantino universe. The Vega Brothers, Grindhouse 2, Django and White Hell, a Bounty Law limited series, and on and on. One thing we do know for sure about Kill Bill, the whereabouts of the pussy wagon. The yellow Chevy, adorned with Funkadelic pink logo and a personalized plate, is still in the possession of QT, who even loaned it out to Lady Gaga and Beyonce for a music video. But don't expect to see him cruising around Hollywood or picking up his son from daycare in it. Quote, it's not a good ride for that. Apparently, even Quentin Tarantino has his limits. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments and thanks for watching.